or um, our, our motivation for thinking about heteroclinic networks and why they could be a model for um, behavior in biological organisms. Um, our main motivation was C. elegans. They're a very well-studied model organism um, for a variety of reasons. Um, they have a pretty simple nervous system that consists of sensory neurons, um, interneurons, which are the neurons that are like processing information um, where in theory, the decisions are being made, and then motor neurons, right? So the interneurons output to the motor neurons, and then the motor neurons are controlling the, um, the body bends and the actual behavioral output for this C. elegans. Um, this, the movie that I had playing here, um, this is showing a C. elegan. Um, you can see that it's transparent, and so you can see um, like all of the cells inside. And since there are so few cells, um, experimentalists are able to actually name, label, um, and identify these neurons and actually image their activity while the C. elegans is, um, is moving around. So like I said, the C. elegans has a very simple nervous system. It only has 302 neurons. Like this is very few neurons um, compared to most organisms. Another interesting thing is that it has a stereotype connectum, which means that each of these neurons is connected in the same way to all of the other neurons. Um, across organisms, which make them a, a great model organism to study because all of the neurons are connected in the same way for each animal. Oh, pardon. As opposed to um, other organisms where you could have a bunch of neurons and they could be connected in different ways. Um, and like I said, the neurons are named and um, experimentalists have identified a lot of um, features and functions for each of these neurons. So on the left here, this is showing, you know, this huge cluster of neurons. There's a lot of recurrent connections going, you know, between the sensory neurons, the interneurons, the motor neurons. But there's a sort of core set within the interneurons that are, you know, responsible for some yeah, of these key uh, characters. For example, the AVA neuron here, this is one of the neurons that's primarily responsible for initiating reversals. Um, and then the AVB neurons, these are primarily responsible for initiating forward swimming. They're connected to a lot of other neurons that modulate the, their behavior. And then there's, you know, specific neurons that are primarily responsible for like the sleep response or different local search responses. Um, and it's unclear, it's not yet clear how all these neurons are interacting to allow the C. elegans to randomly switch between different behaviors and make decisions about um, what its behavioral strategy is going to be at any given time. Um, so in addition to having all of these um, neurons identified, um, experimental will do calcium imaging on the neurons, which, um, you know, they use this like fluorescent protein um, that allows the, the neuron will um, light up when there is a lot of voltage within the neuron. And so this is a, it's not an exact, um, it's not the same as actually being able to measure the voltage, but it is a proxy for the voltage level in the neuron. Um, this video here is showing the um, calcium imaging while the worm is anesthetized. So it's just showing the, the head of the, the C. elegans where all the interneurons are. Um, but more recent studies have been able to do this imaging while the worm is, is swimming around. So they can get a good measure of the behavior in addition to the calcium imaging. So now transitioning to thinking about behaviors. Um, C. elegans, they transition between behavioral states 
randomly, but also in response to stimulus. And a lot of studies um, are done by like providing the C. elegans with a very clear and strong stimulus and seeing how do the neurons react? What is its behavioral response? Um, for example, if you like poke its tail, it'll exhibit an escape response and like, you know, swim forward very quickly. If you, you know, have food, it'll be attracted to the food. Um, but C. elegans don't only, um, you know, exhibit behavioral responses in response to strong stimuli. They also exhibit a variety of different behaviors that they randomly transition between um, in the absence of any be any um, stimulus, which is what we are primarily interested in. What is what are the dynamics going on? What is a good model for these neurons and the random transitions between behaviors when there's not any clear stimulus? Right, this something is going on in the C. elegant head. It's not just, um, you know, inactive until it receives a stimulus and the response to it. Um, there's a lot going on in decisions that are being made um, without any stimulus. So this is a video of C. elegans kind of randomly swimming around. They have a few key behavioral states. Um, so they have a, a forward swimming state. They swim slowly. Um, they exhibit reversals. Um, and then they have a couple different types of they can have a ventral turn and a, a dorsal turn. You can see this, this C. elegans here is, um, you know, exhibiting some different turns here. So in addition to these um, uh, more straightforward behavioral states, there's also long-term behavioral strategies that the C. elegans will exhibit. It'll have local versus global search behavior which are different strategies for finding food. Um, experimentalists have you know, identified the difference between roaming versus dwelling. Quiescence is a sleep state that the C. elegans can enter into at any time, but is also um, developmentally timed. At certain points in its development, it sleeps quite a bit. Um, and then like an escape, response. there's a lot of different longer term behavioral strategies that they exhibit. So we can take these videos of the C. elegans behavior and then produce a time series. And you can see that um, the C. elegans will randomly switch between different behaviors in the absence of any stimulus and spend you know, a variable amount of time um, exhibiting each of these different behaviors, swimming forward, reversal, reversal, turn, et cetera. So here's some um, neural activity of some key um, premotor neurons um, in the interneuron network, um, accompanied by the behavioral response that the C. elegans is exhibiting. Um, so here on the top, we have the neural activity um, and the, on the bottom, the behavior, the green behavior here is reversal. The blue behavior is um, forward swimming. So when the C. elegans is swimming forward, that is associated with these, um, you know, high activity of these forward neurons. So AVB um, and the um, rib neurons. As opposed to when the C. elegan is um, in a reversal mode, the neurons that are active are AVA, RIM, AVE, et cetera. So there are these clusters of neurons that are active in reversal, and then another cluster that is active um, when the C. elegan is swimming forward. And you can see these sort of random transitions between the different behaviors. And this is also exhibited in these um, in the premotor neurons. Right, and so we want to understand. Rim again, just a quick question: What yeah. is your what is your y-axis? What the... is my y-axis here? So for the neural activity, um, this is the um, the calcium imaging. So this is the like fluorescence okay. level. Okay. 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 Yeah. And, of, and of why, the why you have a negative number? Just curious about. 
Yeah, so um, the data, it's like processed quite a bit and normalized. And so it's actually best represented as like a, um, yeah. like a Z score, a difference from sort of um, a mean level of activity. That's okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So this is like roughly a, a, a proxy for voltage level, but this is not like, you know, the exact voltage level or the exact um, brightness level um, that the, this data has all been normalized. Okay. And okay, filtered quite a bit. So, um, yeah, so active versus non active neurons, um, and then the behavioral sequences. And so, what we focused on with this, these chaotic heteroclinic networks is building a very low dimensional model, dynamical systems model that could um, accurately capture the um, variability in dwell time and the um, random transitions um, without the system exhibiting any stimulus. So a system that will randomly produce all of these um, transitions and produce reproduce these transition statistics. Um, so one way that experimentalists have um, sort of captured the um, transitions in the behavior is with Markov matrices. So they identify each of the behaviors um, in the time series, forward, slow, reversal, et cetera. Um, and then they compute the probability of if the C. elegant is in a particular state, what is the probability of it transitioning to, you know, one of the other states? So in, in this figure here, the experimentalists identified eight different behavioral states. So that's a few more than the ones that I've labeled here. Um, and for example, when it is in this blue state, the reversal state, it will transition into either the purple state or the green state. And it's you know slightly more likely to transition to the purple state than the green state. Um, some of these transitions are deterministic. For example, the yellow state here, it always transitions to the red state afterwards uh, with 100% probability. Um, so some of these states have sort of a, there's a 50-50 chance of going to one state or to another after. And then some of the transitions are much more deterministic. They're much more likely to, you know, flow into one of the following states as opposed to another. Um, you can also take the um, neural dynamics and look at the activity in PCA space. Um, the dynamics have been identified as low dimensional. So here, this is the um, looking at how the C. elegant behavior is encoded in the neural dynamic. So this is a plot of the first two PCA modes, and it's been colored by the behavioral state. And so you can see when um, the PCA activity is on the right over here, there's this cluster and it is always blue. So that means that this region of PCA activity, the C. elegant is always exhibiting reversal behavior. And then it'll transition over. You can see these like yellow highways here. It will transition over into a, um, forward state, right? So the low dimensional activity in the, um, in the neural activity um, corresponds very well to these different behavioral states that we see. And so um, like the first question we wanted to ask is how can the dynamics produce these transitions without any input stimulus? What would be a, um, sort of low dimensional toy model for this. Um, so random switching from one pattern of behavior to another, this is a motif seen throughout biology. Our main motivation here and the examples we use um, were all C. elegant um, behavior or random switching, but this doesn't just happen for C. elegans, this happens in a lot of other instances where we'll see random switching and behavior strategies um, without any stimulus. And then 
we've identified that chaotic heteroclinic networks with quantitative control, um, they can be models for this type of behavior and reproduce the transition statistics that we see in the data. So we built a toy model that reproduces the behavioral transition statistics. So I'm going to transition to talking about heteroclinic networks, the model that we set up, and then how we were able to fit that model to the behavioral data that we have. Um, so heteroclinic networks, they consist of fixed points, which thinking about our data, those are going to represent the different behavioral states. So if you're at a fixed point in your dynamics, that would be similar to going back to this slide. Um, if you're like at the blue cluster or the um, red cluster, you're kind of at this fixed point in the dynamics. And at some point, you'll move away from that fixed point to another fixed point in the dynamics. Um, so fixed points, we are thinking of those as associated with a behavioral state. Um, and then the fixed points in a heteroclinic network are connected, and they're connected with heteroclinic orbits. Um, and in our sort of silicon data, this would um, correspond to transitions between behavioral states. So for example, going back to our PCA activity, um, the yellow behavioral here, here, this is a ventral turn. And um, this is a transition between reversal um, going to a forward state. <clears throat> So after a reversal, um, the CL again will exhibit a ventral turn and then um, move forward after that. So that's sort of a transitional behavioral state. Okay, so our heteroclinic network, we have fixed points, we have heteroclinic orbits that re represent transitions. Here, um, this is a figure of a heteroclinic network in 2D and it is continuous. So there are no, um, there's no chaotic dynamics at this point, um, depending on what region you are in and if the um, orbit is attracting, then you might spend more and more time near each fixed point in the cycle. So here on the left, um, I'm showing a heteroclinic cycle um, connecting fixed points P1, P2 and P3, and this is an attracting cycle. So if you're inside here, um, you'll move around between and um, transition between these three points in a predictable way. And um, it, if it is attracting, you'll spend more and more time um, at each fixed point as you um, go around and around, as it is attracted closer and closer to the cycle. However, you would never, um, in the continuous dynamics in 2D, you never be able to actually leave this cycle and be very predictable. Um, so you can have these heteroclinic cycles. You can connect these heteroclinic cycles together into a larger heteroclinic network that can contain any number of fixed points um, that contain cycles connecting them. And so what we wanted to do is create this heteroclinic network and then introduce a chaotic component to it to allow us to randomly transition between fixed points and not just stay um, in a certain heteroclinic cycle. Um, so here's how the, we introduced um, chaos into our system. Um, so before I was talking about a continuous time dynamical system. We took our continuous dynamics in 2D and we um, turned it into a map. We turned it into a discrete time dynamical system where now our next um, point um, is a, I should have written X of, um, X of N here, is a function of the previous point in time. So we move forward in time discreetly um, our unperturbed dynamics are going to be exactly the same as our continuous dynamics, except now there's a discrete version of that. The way that um, 
we add um, chaos to the system is with perturbations. And we add perturbations to the dynamics at um, particular points along the heteroclinic orbits. Um, so for example, here is a connection between fixed point P1 and fixed point P2. Um, and in within a certain region, um, here we create a ball that encapsulates the region going from X1 to X2. So in our unperturbed dynamics, um, point X1 is mapped to X2, which is then mapped to X3, et cetera. And we, you know, move discreetly from fixed point P1 to fixed point P2. But now with our perturbed dynamics, um, we take the points in this region and we add a small perturbation to them. And that is this function um, G naught of X. And so now all of the points along this line S are mapped um, to this curve here, F of S. And so whereas S used to previously be mapped to this dotted line here, all the points along S were mapped to the dotted line. Now they are pushed slightly above or below the heteroclinic um, connection there. And so now the points don't um, all converge to P2. Now, instead, they are a perturbed slightly above or slightly below that heteroclinic connection. And so those points are either going to move up along the up branch or down along the down branch after getting close to P2. <clears throat> Um, so all of the points in this ball are a perturbation is applied to them. And then the um, dynamics continue along as usual. This is the only point um, where we add a perturbation. So after that is added, then we map the points forward in time. And then they're mapped to um, the, the perturbation is um, enhanced um, at every point in time. Um, and so you can see that the points that were perturbed above now get very close to P2, and then they follow that branch. The points that are perturbed below get very close to P2, and then they follow the down branch after that. And so we have this um, transversal intersection now between um, the, the stable branch and then the unstable branch here. So they're no longer the same. Um, and this introduces chaos into our system. And so this allows us to have some probability of moving up versus down um, after um, getting close to six point P1. So we add these perturbations along every branch connecting our fixed Um, so here is how the perturbations affect the dwell times near the fixed points. Um, say that this is the perturbation that we are applying along the heteroclinic connection. Um, this will result in a distribution away from um, that connection here. Um, points that are perturbed very far away, <clears throat> they are not going to spend a whole lot of time near the fixed point. So we draw this dwell radius around the fixed point, and then we just measure the amount of time that the points spend in the dwell radius. And so if they're perturbed far away, they, they don't spend a whole lot of time in the dwell radius. However, if they're not perturbed that far, for example, these points, they get very close to P2, and they spend a lot of time in the dwell radius because they are, um, you know, not perturbed that far off the heteroclinic connection. And so we can actually then, you know, um, run simulations and measure the amount of time um, that, you know, points as they approach P2, how much time they spell, they spend in the dwell radius if they're going um, up afterwards versus down. Another way that we're able to control the amount of time that points spend in the dwell radius is with the, um, the eigenvalues associated with each of these fixed points, right? And so if we have a smaller eigenvalue, then that actually will shift the dwell time distribution. 
here's two different um, very extreme shapes for our perturbation. Hey, we, we get we have a question in the yeah in the, in yeah the, oh, I just, wasn't reading the chat yeah what's yeah um the question is so can you be more um can, can you explain what what does it mean? Perturbation controls dwell time. I just repeat the question. Can you explain more? Can you feel? Can you make us feel that? What does it mean? Uh, can you give you insights. What does it mean exactly? What perturbation controls dwell time? Yeah. Um. So the perturbation here. Here's two example perturbations. Here's like a sawtooth perturbation and a square wave, and depending oh. on what we said is the perturbation, how large it is, what the shape it is, then that will affect the amount of time that those points <coughs> spend near the next fixed point. Okay. And so if you, if you, in the extreme example, say that you have no perturbation at all, all of the, the, the points along this, this region S here, are going to converge to P2 and they spend an infinite amount of time right. at your next saddle fixed point. <clears throat> um, if you have a very minor um, perturbation away from that S interval, then they're going to spend tons of time near your fixed point before then leaving because they haven't been perturbed very far. But if you perturb them very far away from that header clinic connection, um, <laughs> then they don't get sucked in very close to that fixed point um and then you know this is a saddle they get pushed away um fairly close oh, oh yeah because they're always like approaching a saddle fixed point next and so you have all of these points that are approaching the saddle and then you're measuring you know how how close they're getting and <clears throat> the amount of time they're spending um before leaving the saddle Oh, it would be nice to have an explanation. Why? Why? Why this shape? Oh, I, as I see this, this uh, toe tooth. Uh, so you will spend l less time with this. This the, the first the, the square wave. You will spend more time. The square wave. So the square wave. The points that are perturbed far away. Um. Here you have the distribution of like distance away from that heteroclinic orbit. The points that are perturbed far away spend very little time. So that's this, um, all this right. bar here. Sure. Those are all the points that got perturbed <clears throat> far away. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then the points that really are yeah, still yeah. very close to that orbit, they actually spend a lot of time. And so that's what this tail is here. Ah, yeah. The very long dwell times are the points that got perturbed slightly, slightly mm -hmm. off the and, connection. Uh, yeah. I see. I see. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Okay. So the perturbation affects the dwell time, but you can also shift um the dwell time distribution using the um <clears throat> unstable manifold eigenvalue. So if you have a larger eigenvalue, then points will move away from the saddle quicker. If you have a smaller eigenvalue, they don't move away as quickly. <clears throat> okay, so using the setup, we then um, fit a header clinic network um, to um, behavioral state time series um, that we had for C. elegans. Um, so in this particular data set, um, the experimentalists labeled four different behaviors for quiescence, reversal, and turn. Here's our, uh, you know, snippet of our behavioral state time series and the Markov model associated with it. So you can see, for example, when the C. elegant is in a forward state, it has a 75% chance of transitioning to reversal. Um, and then a 25% chance of sleeping afterwards. <clears throat> and so after each behavior, it will exhibit one of two other behaviors. So this um, allows us to 
represent these transitions um, with a bunch of um, saddle fixed points connected together together into a header clinic network. And then we introduce these perturbations along the orbits that will give us these transition um, statistics. This is slight more, more nuanced though than just the transition probabilities because um, you can see in this graph here um, that the transition probability actually depends on the amount of time that C. elegans spends in um, different states. For, so for example, the forward duration, if it isn't swimming forward for very long, so between zero and three seconds, then it's very likely to transition to reversal afterwards. As opposed to if it's swimming forward for a very long time, that makes it much more likely to transition to quiescence. So if it's swimming forward a lot, then it'll become more and more likely to want to sleep afterwards. Um, and so this is a, the transitions are a function of the state that it's in, but also the amount of time that is spending in in each of those states. <clears throat> so we wanted to fit a chaotic heteroclinic network um, to the transition probabilities, but also the dwell times and the transition probabilities dependent on the dwell times. Um, so here is our toy header clinic network that has um, three saddle fix points that represent the three um, dwelling behavioral states, reversals, quiescence, and forward. And then you have this current state, which is a transitional behavioral state. Here along one of the heteroclinic connections, this is the shape of the perturbation that sees that we blew up. Um, the perturbation does not have to be that large in order to produce the desired effect. Um, and so with this particular perturbation shape, we were able to reproduce the transition statistics that we see in the data when you're going from the quiescent state to the reversal state. And then, you know, from the reversal state back to the quiescence or turning and then going to the forward state. So the way that we construct these toy models is we first decide how many fixed points that we would like to have in the system. Um, and then we connect all of our fixed points with local linear dynamics and then use um, translational dynamics and rotational dynamics to make these connections. So these are the building blocks that we're using to actually um, put this heteroclinic network together um, in two dimensions. Um, so we decide what our local linear dynamics are going to be, um, what the eigenvalues we want to be that are associated with the stable and unstable manifold for that saddle. Um, and then we use these weighting functions um, to smoothly transition between different local dynamics. Um, so we might have our linear dynamics and then we might connect the stable and unstable manifolds with translational dynamics. Um, and then we add a rotation actually to make the, the turns here. Um, so along here, we have translational dynamics, rotational dynamics. Um, and so we just put these building blocks together um, with these um, weighting functions that allow us to smoothly transition between those. And then we're able to, you know, put any number of saddle fixed points in our system and connect them um, to the other saddle points in our system. Um, and so that means that no matter how many behavioral states we have, we can um, plant them in our two-dimensional dynamics um, using these building blocks. Um, on the on the right here, I am um, showing different ways that we can modify our perturbation. Um, so we can introduce upward bias or downward bias um, to our perturbation function, um, and that will make points um, move upwards after the fixed point. 
um, versus make them more likely to move downwards after the fixed point. We can also induce short dwell times by perturbing points far away from the heteroclinic connect connection or induce longer dwell times by, per by perturbing most fixed points um, not that far away. So now going back to our data, these are the results from fitting our um, heteroclinic network from the four behavioral state data. Um, these are the transition probabilities that we see in the data. And then here is our the transition probabilities that we see on our model. So we fit our model, we run a bunch of simulations, and then we're able to actually reproduce these transition statistics. We're also able to reproduce the, um, the transition probabilities as a function of dwell time, right? And we do this by manipulating our perturbation function, um, our, the perturbation component of our, of our dynamics. So we're able to reproduce that. Now in our toy model, the, um, the system will be more and more likely to transition to the quiescent state the longer it spends um, in that forward state. And so now the transition probability becomes a function of the dwell time. Um, we also did this on a larger, more complex data set where experimentalists, completely separate data set, they identified eight different behavioral states now. Um, and this is the PCA activity associated with it. So they identified these additional behavioral states, um, right? They broke the forward swimming into two states, um, forward and then forward slow. They um, have these rev one and rev two states. And so this is, a, they did a little bit more detail um, in their behavioral state identification. Um, so we took the time series for this other data set, and then we, um, in our two-dimensional toy model, now we have one, two, three, four, um, five, six different saddle um, fixed points that we plant in our two-dimensional dynamics, and then we connect these with our um, transitions, our heteroclinic orbits. And before each fixed point, we introduce a perturbation that will allow us to reproduce the transition statistics that we saw from the data. So here on the left, we have the data transition probabilities, um, and then simulating our model. These are the transition probabilities that we see in our model that can reproduce all these transition statistics. Um, here are some example trajectories that we get. Um, and so these are, are the experimental measurements. This is from Linderman 2019, um, one of the data sets that we use. And you can see that if you start from different fixed points, you get these random transitions between behaviors. And um, we are able to reproduce similar activity in our toy model. So these heteroclinic networks um, can reproduce the C. elegant behavioral statistics. Our heteroclinic networks, they are deterministic, yet they can reproduce seemingly stochastic switches um, because you know points, they will converge the heteroclinic connection. And then with these perturbations, then that is how we introduce the, um, the stochastic switches. Um, the perturbations along heteroclinic orbits, they can control transition probabilities as well as dwell times. And then heteroclinic network dynamics. This may be a good model for how biological systems can flexibly encode behavioral sequences. So we fit these models simply to the behavioral time series of the dwell times. Um, the, the next step, what we want to do is we want to be able to actually fit the um, calcium imaging, the neural time series um, to models like this to show how um, the neural dynamics, perhaps the best low dimensional model for them would be a chaotic heteroclinic network. 
Um, and then I'd like to thank Lai Sang, who um, I did this work with at NYU. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs>